His cross and the salvation that we have in Him. It is a great love that God has shown us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And 1 John 4 tells us that in this is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. This morning we're going to look at how the love of God and the cross of Christ and how the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ is to transform our lives. Specifically in our relationship to one another. And specifically in our love for one another. I want to direct our attention this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That, uh, chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That great chapter on love. Now basically since I've been a new believer, I've understood something about the importance of love. And as we grow as believers, we just grow in our understanding of the Lord and His Word, right? We just grow in our understanding more and more and more. One of us to teach the Alpha Omega Sunday School class. And we're going through the book of 1 Corinthians. And a while back, we were in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I was reminded again, reminded in a fresh way, and encouraged and challenged on love. And the love that we are to have and practice and demonstrate to one another as believers. Before we jump into the text, let me read two verses from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. Paul says to a very new church, Now as for the love of the brethren, you have no need for anything, for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you do practice it toward all the brethren from Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, excel still more. Three quick things from those two verses. Number one, God Himself teaches believers to love one another. Love is a defining mark of believers. We are not saved by our love, but those who have trusted Christ and been born again, God produces His love in our lives. And He Himself teaches us to love one another. It's a mark of true salvation. Second thing, love is not only something we possess, but something that we practice. It's not just something that we have, but something that we do. The Thessalonians were told that they were practicing love toward all the brethren. And number three, no matter how long we've been in the Lord, whether it's been five minutes or 50 years, whether we're doing well or doing poorly at the moment, as believers, we're to excel still more in love, to keep pushing forward, to be practicing love and our uh, practicing love for one another. Now, 1 Corinthians, the church at Corinth was a blessed church. It really was. Paul took the gospel of Corinth. He preached the gospel of the crucified and resurrected Messiah. And some believed. And those who believed were brought into fellowship with God. And they were growing in the Lord. They were waiting for Christ from heaven. They had the sure hope of heaven. And they were even blessed with great knowledge and all the gifts they needed to function properly as a church. A blessed church. Yet despite all their blessings, the church at Corinth struggled. They had many troubles, many problems, many divisions as we know it. As we study the book. As I study through 1 Corinthians, it seems that there's two main problems that they have. Really two sides of the same coin. Number one problem they have is their pride. Their arrogance. And in that, they're letting worldly thinking and worldly living slip into the church and be mixed with God's wisdom. The other side of the coin was their lack of love. They were not doing all they did for the benefit of others. Even in their knowledge, even with their gifts, they functioned, some of them at least, functioned for self-exaltation instead of to exalt the Lord and edify fellow believers. Their lack of love and their pride went hand in hand. So 1 Corinthians 13, the great love chapter. Now, 1 Corinthians 13 is not on an island by itself. It's right in the middle of a larger section. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 all deal with spiritual gifts. And after dealing with spiritual gifts and truths about them generally in chapter 12, and before moving to chapter 14 to talk about regulations, about the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy, Paul has this chapter right in the midst of spiritual gifts on love. Look at chapter 12, verse 31. He says, 
but earnestly desire greater, the greater gifts. Gifts are good, but gifts are important. They're needed. And I show you a still more excellent way. Then he goes into chapter 13, if we haven't broken down today, he talks about love. Gifts are important. They're needed for the growth of the church, but it's not the most important thing. The most important thing, the more excellent way, is the way of love. And that's what chapter 13 is about. And chapter 13 is broken up into three sections. In verse 1 through 3, Paul talks about the importance of love. He shows how serious it is if you don't have love. In chapter 4 to 7, he talks about the practice of love, what love does, what love looks like. Then in verse 8 to verse 13, he talks about the permanence of love. Love is the greatest because love lasts the longest. In fact, it lasts forever. This morning, we're going to touch on the first and the third section in chapter 13, but we'll focus in on the second section, the middle section, verse 4, to remember the beginning of verse 8, the practice of love. But verse 1 through 3, just briefly first, in verse 1 through 3, Paul gives three parallel statements that say, if you do this, 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 and this, but do not have love, he gives a consequence. Look at verse 1. He says, if we speak with the tongues of men or of angels and do not have love, I have become a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Uh, he had the greatest gift of tongues, but it wasn't being used in love, being driven by and controlled by, governed by love, you're just an annoying loud mouth. A noisy gong, even worse. Verse 2, if you have the, gift, the greatest gift of prophecy, know all knowledge and all mysteries, and have the greatest faith, and yet do not have love, he says, I am nothing. The greatest gifts of prophecy, knowledge, faith, without love, you'd be a zero. Verse 3, if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, I surrender my body to be burned, and do not have love, it profits me nothing. The greatest gifts, the greatest service, the greatest sacrifice, if it's not governed by and driven by love, it's zero profit. I am worthless, and it profits me nothing. You know, a scary thing, a serious thing. You know, 1 John says if there's no love for fellow believers, specifically in 1 John, there's no Savior. There's no salvation. Because God produces His love in our lives. And as believers, to the extent that we serve, use our gifts even, and even sacrifice, to the extent that we do those things without love, it results in a zero. There's no scary thing. You know, I can stand up and preach the best sermon I've ever preached, not driven by and functioning in love. I'll get no profit for that. You could pour your life out in service and die early because of it. If it's not governed by love, it would profit you nothing. So a very important question becomes, what is love? And what does love look like? Now there's a popular dance song in the 90s. I didn't never dance to it. But the song said, what is love? And there was no answer to the song really. It's just that annoying beat getting stuck in your head. <laughs> but what is love? And there's no answer to it. You know, a lot of confusion about what love is and what love does. And we must be careful as believers. We must not look to the world for what love is. On the one hand, the world defines love as just infatuation, or worse yet, sinful lust. You know, we sometimes have the saying, might makes right. Well, in love, some other people just say, love is love. If you desire to do it, then it must be right, it must be love. Also, the world defines love as just blanket approval. Not only you follow your own desire, the most important thing seemingly in the world today is be true to yourself, whatever that means. The Bible says, don't trust your own heart. But on the other side, so that's what love is to do. And then for others, just blindly accepting all that they do. Is that what love is? Also, we must be careful not to look into our in, inside of ourselves to find the definition of love, our own heart, our own understanding. Jeremiah 17 says, we're deceitful. Proverbs 3 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. 
and do not lean on your own understanding. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 26 says, He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. We must be very careful as believers to go to God's Word for our definitions. What the Bible talks about it, we have to take the Bible's description and definition of love. So what is love? What's love look like? Before we look at verse 4, jump back to chapter 12, verse 25, if you would. In the context of God gifting different believers differently in the body to function, he says in chapter 12, verse 25, the Lord has given different gifts so there will be no divisions instead of gifts causing division or to cause unity. And that the members may have the same care for one another. And that word care is translated in other places, anxiety. The word anxiety, the word translated here, can be used negatively as anxiety or positively as care. And we use the word English word concern kind of in the same way. I'm concerned in a negative way or I'm concerned in a positive way. And then chapter 13, verse 4 to 7, after talking about the importance of love in verse 1 through 3, he describes love. And in verse 4 to 7, early the beginning of verse 8, the Apostle Paul, by the Spirit, gives 16 verbs that love, of what love does. 16 actions, practices of love. He doesn't describe what love is exactly, although these are related. He describes what love does. There's 16 actions of verb. Love does this. Now, don't get confused. Now, all these things we're going to look at, all these, these verbs that we'll look through, they're not all external actions of the body. Some of them are internal actions of the spirit, the mind, the heart, the inner man. But they're all actions. There are 16 verbs here. There are seven positive, what, seven positive things what love does, and nine negatives what love doesn't do. And these things, this is not exhaustive. This is not all the Bible says about love. Uh, other passages colored in it in different ways and did it from a different angle. But it does give us a good picture. And we will also not be exhaustive. You could do a, an independent study on every one of these actions of love. But we'll look through them. And as we look through them, we can look at the Word of God, like a mirror, like James says, and hold our lives up to it and say, how am I doing? Do I need to make any changes, any adjustments? Where do I need to grow? Where do I need to excel still more? And the tendency, I'll say this up front, is to say, yep, yeah, they need to do that. They need to do that. And that might be true. What love does is say, what, what do I need to do? How do I need to function in love? So let's look through them. And there's a lot of overlap and close connection between these. But verse 4, and I, I think I'll give numbers with them as I go through. You don't have to record the numbers, though. Paul doesn't have numbers with them. But we'll look through them. Verse 4. What is love? What's love do? Love is patient. He starts with the fact that love is patient. And love is an interesting word. We know it's the word agape. Different words. Greek words for love. The, the noun here is agape. Interestingly, the verb agapao was common in the Greek world before the New Testament. But the noun, agape, wasn't very common. It was used a little bit, but not a lot. And yet this becomes the prime word for love in the New Testament. Seemingly because the Lord wants to not completely redefine, but give a special Christian focus, so to speak, on what love is. So a word that wasn't actually very common before the New Testament, agape becomes the main word for our love. Other words are used too, though. Love is patient. The word for patience means long-suffering. It's a verb. It means love suffers long. It suffers over a long time. And two external things are needed for patience. Number one, you need some sort of suffering, some sort of difficulty. And number two, you need some time. You know, no one ever says, you know, my life is perfect. It's super easy. I have no problems. Family is great. Job's great. All relationships are great, you know. Pray for patience. Well, you don't need patience. Things are good. Also, no one says, you know what? I went through a trial. It lasted about three and a half seconds. It's done now. So I need patience. Now, patience implies difficulty over time. And love is patient with circumstances. But specifically in the context of 1 Corinthians 13, we're dealing with believers. And the context here, that love is to be applied to all of our relationships. Family, marriage, work, 
But the direct context is to our relationship with one another in the church. Love is patient. When other people make your life more difficult, give you some sort of suffering, love is the opposite of the short fuse. Love is long-suffering. And of course, the Lord's patient with us, right? He is patient toward us, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to life. I rejected the Lord until I was almost 19. But He was patient with me, giving me time. He could have slayed me right then, before salvation. He's patient. And even since we've been believers, right? None of us have lived perfectly since we've been believers, but the Lord is patient with us. Long-tempered. And it's what the Spirit produces in the life. An interesting study for you. Compare the characteristics of love here with the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. You're going to find over half of the fruit of the Spirit are listed as the actions of love. These things flow out of love. Love is patient. You know, when difficult comes and when people bring you difficulty, we many times want to not be patient. You know, one thing we should do it as, this is an opportunity for me to practice love by practicing long-suffering. Patient. But does that mean love is just passive? No, look at the second characteristic, verse 4. Love is kind. Not only is it patient, if we call that a little bit passive, maybe, it's long-suffering, it's also kind. As we get to verb, it's, it kinds. It's not proper, it acts kindly. Love is kind. When you think of kindness, don't think of just being nice. You know, nice, one of the definitions of nice at least is the idea of being being pleasant, being agreeable. Those things are all, that, that's important. You're going to be pleasant and agreeable. But kind has a greater force than that. It's the idea of being useful. Not just I'm pleasant, but I'm useful. You want to say kindness is love in work clothes. It's one to roll up its sleeves and get dirty, so to speak. It's not content to be in the bleachers, to be on the sideline. It wants to serve. It wants to be helpful. You know, sometimes you see an athlete talking about it. What position do you want to play? Well, anything to help the team. Anything to help. Well, what do you really want to play? I just want to help. Well, that's the idea of kindness. We want to be useful. We want to be helpful to others. And this means wisely using our spiritual gifts, not indiscriminately using our spiritual gifts. If you have the gift of service, for example, I mean, you use that to help vacuum the church. It wouldn't be kind for you to go to the vacuum right now, come in here, turn it on, and well, it's good to do it, but you know, not the, not the right time. You know, the, gift, the teacher, wouldn't it be useful for me to come to your house at 2 a.m., you know, open the door and just start preaching at you? Well, it's not the right time. So it's not just an indiscriminate use of spiritual gifts. Now it's part of the problem with the Corinthians. They're exalting spiritual gifts, but not functioning. And how can we be useful, helpful to others? And of course, God is kind. Listen to Luke chapter 6, verse 35 and following. Just listen. It says, But love your enemies and do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For He Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful as your Heavenly Father is merciful. Kindness is not just, I'll be kind to those who are kind to me. It's, I'll be kind even when I'm suffering long. So love is patient. Love is kind. Third thing in verse 4, love is not jealous. He's going to now list eight things in a row, eight things in a row that love does not do. And first off, he says, love is not jealous. And all these are verbs, actions. But they're not just all external actions of the body. They're internal actions of the inner man as well. The idea of jealousy the word uh, came from that to be boiling. The idea of the word meant to be boiling, to be passionate about something, to passionately, earnestly desire something. It can, use, it can be used in a positive way to earnestly desire something that is yours, your spouse, or something that is good. The benefit, we many times use the word zeal, and we use it in English in a positive way, that burning, boiling up desire for something positive. Jealousy can be also be used in a negative way, that burning, passionate desire of resentment. Specifically, when someone else has something and you don't, 
and you desire it, and you're not content with what the Lord has given you. You know, jealousy isn't only appreciating what the Lord has given to someone else, and oh yeah, they have a nice house, they have this or that, that's, that's good for them. It's seeing that, and then wishing you had it, and usually also wishing they didn't have it. You know, it's quite foolish. It makes someone else's blessing my pain. You know, God's been good and gifted someone else with a, a blessing, a physical blessing or a spiritual gift. And then I turn that blessing into jealousy, a burning desire. I wish, wish they wish they did anger on the inside. You know, on the opposite side, what does love do? Love is not jealous, but it'd be glad for someone else's blessing. The Lord blesses someone else with something physically or a recognition or whatever it might be. It's not love. Oh, yeah, I think that. Love would be glad for them, thankful what the Lord has given. You know, this is not how I do my Bible studies usually, so don't get afraid. But I asked Alexa, the little machine, <laughs> what's the opposite of jealousy? And Alexa said, carelessness. That's not true. The opposite of jealousy isn't carelessness. It would be care, really. Um, care in the positive sense. In jealousy, it's all sin is not only wicked and rebellious, it's also foolish. And jealousy, you just see that even more easily, maybe. You know, it takes the blessings God's given someone else and turns it into my torment. Makes yourself your own tormentor. And it destroys. You know about this Saul, you know about King Saul in the Old Testament, right? What happens? David has some victories, some blessings. Saul has some other issues too. But Saul's jealous about David. And that leads him into more and more sin. And sin does spread. It's not that it wasn't Saul's only issue, but jealousy will spread out. James 4 says, the source of conflicts among us is selfish ambition and bitter jealousy. You know, I, just, I want to be exalted. I want that. I wish they didn't have that. And it's also rebellious against God. You know, It's being angry at God for Him blessing someone else. You know, God's gracious to someone else in one way or another, and I turn that, I'm going to be angry about that. How foolish it is. I'm not going to trust God to provide what I need, but He knows His best for me. You know, a few, a while ago, I don't remember how long, but I, worked, I learned a new word, um, FOMO, F-O-M-O, -O, it's actually an acronym. I didn't know it existed, but someone gave it to me. An acronym, they use it on social media, fear of missing out. And apparently, especially young, especially young people, get on social media and see that everything their friends are doing and they, get, they have a fear of missing out. Usually that probably comes from jealousy. They have this. They have that. They're doing this. They're doing that. Love, that's not what love does. Love is not jealous. Also, verse 4, the fourth thing, love does not brag. Love is not in the self-promotion. It does not brag. It's not trying to lift itself up above others and push others down. You know, the world exalts boasting and bragging. I am the greatest. Maybe not the greatest, which is very, very good, better than all those other people. That's not what love does. Proverbs 27, 2 says, let another praise you and not your own mouth. We're not into self-exaltation, boasting ourselves above others. We're not into it for a show-off, to be show-off and get the applause of men. Love does not brag. And I work with young people. You know, we, people do this with their words. And any sort of communication device can be used to brag. I'm not against social media, so I don't think you need to delete all your social media accounts. But as sinners, we use social media and everything the Lord has given sometimes for ill. So on the one hand, people are jealous as they see what others have and do on social media. And on the other hand, people use social media to brag. In one way or another. Not, maybe I'm not against social media. But it is what... People use it for at times. You know, the first John says, the boastful pride of life. And that's what so much of it is. We are to boast in the Lord. We sang about that a little bit this morning. Jeremiah says, I'm not the wise man boasting his wisdom, the mighty man boasting his might, the rich man boasting his riches. Well, let, let him who boasts boast in this. That he knows and understands me, my character. That's where our boast is. And there's a sense we brag on others. We exalt others, not self. Verse 4 continues. Love is, does not brag. Love is not arrogant. This is the inner attitude that 
Right? Dragging flows from. Love is not arrogant. The word literally means to be puffed up, to be inflated with air. It's an important word in 1 Corinthians. The word is used seven times in the New Testament. You know how many times it's used in 1 Corinthians? It's used six times of the Corinthians. They were puffed up. They had an improper view of themselves, their own knowledge, their own gifts themselves. Turn back to a passage or two on this. Turn back to chapter 4, if you would. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Basically, all of chapter 1 through 4, he deals with the divisions the church had over personalities. And uses, well, I'll pick up verse 6 of chapter 4. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied with Apollos to myself and Apollos for your sake. So you may learn not to exceed what is written, so that no one will become arrogant in behalf of one against another. You know, arrogance is always going beyond the word of God. Becoming arrogant against each other. That's not submitting ourselves to the word of God. Verse 7, For who regards you as superior? What you have you did not receive. And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? The word arrogance is used in verse 6 there. And Paul says, what do you have in verse 7 you didn't receive? What do you have? Believer, do you have anything in your life you haven't received? Anything physically? All that, every breath I take, a gift from the Lord. My salvation is from Him. Any ability I have to serve Him, giftedness, strength, whatever, it's all from Him. I turn that around into, I'm going to boast about that. That's foolish. It's all from the Lord. Go to, go to chapter 8, verse 1 as well. One more verse that uses this word arrogant, puffed up. You know, in our knowledge and truth should make us humble. We should be like Isaiah 66, 2. When it trembles at God's word, submits, we submit ourselves to it as we understand it more and more. But in our sin, we can take God's good gifts, including gifts and knowledge, and use them to elevate ourselves. And that's what the Corinthians were doing. Chapter 8, verse 1. Second half of it. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. Now, it's not saying here knowledge is not important. In fact, there's no salvation, there's no growth apart from knowledge. A person does not hear about Christ and believe, they cannot be saved. If a person isn't growing their knowledge of God's Word, they have no food to feast on. They cannot grow. He's not saying knowledge is bad here. But he does say it can be used to harm if it's not governed by love. If our lives aren't governed by the love that God has shown us in Christ, and He is producing His character, character progressively in our lives, and we take even God's good gifts and turn them around and use them as weapons against one another. That's what the Corinthians were doing. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That's not what love does. You know, it's been noted that you could put in the, uh, the Corinthians name here and basically the exact opposite would be true of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The Corinthians are not patient. They're not kind. They are jealous. They do break. They are arrogant. Verse 6, he goes on. Uh, verse 5. Love does not act unbecomingly. And if you're keeping a list, this is the sixth thing. Love does not act unbecomingly. Interesting one here. The idea here is it, uh, the idea of the word is it, it's not without proper form, proper shape. The idea here is love is not rude. Love has proper manners. Love is courteous and considerate. Love not only knows what's right and wrong, but also knows what's proper and improper in the right situation. And you can study chapter 8 to 10 on your own to see how Paul talks about the use of liberties, of freedoms, true freedoms that believers have in Christ. But those true freedoms could be used to destroy a fellow believer, to be rude. Love is not rude. And this will apply in all areas. You know, I never played basketball, but in, in basketball they say, I think at least I've heard them say it, I played, clock and score, or clock, clock, score and clock. 
You always know your surroundings, basically, you know how much time is left, know the score, and make the right move. You know, football down in distance. Well, love, same thing. Not only know what's right and wrong, but be sensitive to others that you're around, to not step on their, um, their conscience, not wound their conscience. You know, believers should be considerate. Not just, I know the truth, I'm going to do it. Who cares what you think? Well, we didn't practice the truth in one sense, regardless of what people think. But we're considerate, we're kind. This is a proper time and place for this. Ecclesiastes. There's a proper time and place for everything under the sun. That time and place doesn't mean it's right now. Love does not act unbecomingly. Verse 5 continues. Love does not seek its own. You know, before salvation, we are consumed and enslaved to sin and consumed by selfishness. We live for me and myself and I. But Christ died to free us from sin. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 15 says that Christ died so that we would no longer live for ourselves, but for Him who died and rose again on our behalf. Love does not seek its own. It's not me. I'm going to get mine. Good luck. Turn back to chapter 10, if you would. They had the, the Corinthians had this problem in the area of their, their freedoms, their liberties as well. Back in chapter 10, look at verse 24. Paul commands, Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. And he gives this specific example of food that they had in 1 Corinthians, and how they were to use their liberties in love. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love does not seek its own. Now there's a paradox. You know, the best thing for me is to do what the Bible says. And the best thing for me, now it might be great difficulty and great sacrifice in this life, but the best, best thing for me in this life, and especially in the life to come in eternity, is to not seek my own. You know, God causes all things to work together for good. His commands are good. So we think, if I'm not watching out for me, who's going to watch out for me? Well, the Lord would. He'll provide my needs. He'll provide all I need. But love doesn't have itself at the top of the pyramid, so to speak. It, it's kind. How can I be useful to others? Not just how can I be useful to myself. And again, in the direct context of 1 Corinthians 13, apply to the gifts. And our service for one another. Not just how can I serve so I can be exalted, so people can think this about me or that about me. But how can I serve? Is there a spot that needs serving? Put me in, coach. I'm not going to seek my own. Verse 5 continues. And if you're keeping a list, which I think I messed up on the list, but now we're number 8. The 8th action characteristic of love. It even seek, doesn't seek its own when it's provoked and when it's wrong. Verse 5. Love does not act unbecomingly. It doesn't seek its own. It is not provoked. Provoked has the idea of being jabbed with a sharp object to cause anger or to cause action. Love is not provoked. You know, self is not the center of love. Love doesn't have itself at the center. So you know, when someone does something to you, it's not easily angered and irritated. It's not provoked to respond in kind. My kids are always provoking one another. Maybe not always, but they pretty much always. <laughs> you hear, uh, hear something going on. <laughs> too much away. But what happened? They did this to me. They did that to me. They did that. That isn't. You worry about you. Even if they were mean to you, don't punch them back in the face. Don't be mean back to them. Love is not provoked because love doesn't have itself at the center. You know, the more selfish we are, the more miserable we'll be, and the more we'll be provoked because everything someone does, it'll be jabbing me in the gut. Can't, don't they know how important I am? Love is not provoked. Doesn't mean there's not provocations. It's patient, long suffering. See how these go hand in hand. Number nine, verse five. Love does not take into account wrong suffered. Taking into account as it is, it's not keeping a ledger, keeping books, keeping track. The wrong suffered is literally the evil or the the bad. 
You know, we will be wrong. In the world, obviously, it's true, right? Others will wrong us, will sin against us. And that's also true in the church. Now, there's no excuse for sin. It's not that I'm looking forward to anything like that or hoping people do, but it's a reality. Until glory, I am not perfect, and you are not perfect. And we will sin and be not as we should. We will suffer wrong. But what love does is it keeps track of it. It doesn't keep a ledger. It doesn't build a grudge. It doesn't want to say, you know what, I'll get them back. Or at least, you know, take for tack. They did this one, back and then they didn't do this one. That's not love. Love is seeking the good of the other. Not saying, you know what, if you only knew what they did to me, then you would understand why I can't. Be loving? Was our love based on others' love or is love based on the love that we've experienced and entrusted in Christ? Love does not seek its own. You know, and it forgives. Does it keep, you know, some people literally keep a ledger. Most people don't maybe keep a paper one, but they keep it in their mind. You know, you know what they did to me? I know everything that person did to me back in junior high. That's not love. That's seeking self interest. Love forgives. You know, I was a double murderer. I think he's still living, but he may have passed away. Um, guilty. Killed his wife or fiance and her lover 34 years ago. Um, and guilty. And now what anybody spends a lot of his time doing, there's a lot of his time sitting around writing petty grievances against the guards. That's kind of like we are when we don't forgive, when we keep track of it. Illustration breaks down. But we as believers have been forgiven in the Lord fully. No one could ever sin against me to the extent or as much as I sin against the Lord. Yet I'm going to sit around and keep, you know what, they did this, they did that. Mark chapter 11, verse 25, Christ says, Whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, I'm not going to think, I won't forgive until someone comes to me and begs my forgiveness. There might be a time for, for reconciliation, but love forgives, does not take into account wrong suffered, and forgets it. Doesn't mean you couldn't maybe call it to mind. But it's not functioning, you know what? I'm not functioning based on if I'm functioning in love, based on how you treat me. I'm functioning in love regardless. Verse 6 has a contrast in look at verse 6. The next two things love does. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. You know, it's been said that what a man rejoices in is the fair test of his character. Fair test of his love. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. He does not rejoice in himself or others breaking God's standard of right and wrong of righteousness. And it cannot rejoice in unrighteousness. Unrighteousness, sin, is always bad for someone. So in love you can't rejoice for someone who's harming themselves. This is one of the ways the world completely contradicts the Word of God. And in the homosexual lifestyle and all that push, this is a, one clear example. The world says, if you don't just tolerate and approve, but celebrate and rejoice with me in unrighteousness, then you're hating. You know, back in Isaiah's day, Isaiah chapter 5 says, some call bitter sweet and sweet bitter, Good, evil, and evil, good. And we still live in that world. It is not hate to not join with someone and celebrate their sin. And that's just an easy example. In any sin, love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. It takes no pleasure in sin, especially sin of others. You hear about someone else sin, sinning, someone else falling. It takes no pleasure in that. Watch out for gossip. You know, most time what gossip is is talking about, not, oh, they're so great, they talking about something that happened, you know? Love does not rejoice in hearing that. Love does not rejoice in the gospel itself. I'm just going to mention this and move on so I don't cause too much trouble. This would apply to, if love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, this would inform our entertainment choices. I can't rejoice in sin. I can't be entertained by unrighteousness. Now love. On the other side, verse 6, love rejoices with the truth. 
Interestingly, it says not love rejoices in righteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Because what righteousness is, is the practice of truth. And love rejoices with the truth. Rejoices in knowing the truth of God and living the truth of God and seeing others live and practice the truth of God. You know, love's glad when someone else does well. If a child you love and they get an A, you're not like, ugh, I didn't get an A in that class. No, good job. Love rejoices when someone does well. And the best thing a person can do is practice the truth. Is live righteously. And love rejoices in that. Love is not indifferent. It refuses to rejoice in unrighteousness. It rejoices in, in the truth. In practicing the truth. Verse 7. He, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. For all encompassing terms, as he starts to wrap up what love does. It bears all things. Others' weaknesses, others' warts, others' immaturities, even other sin. You know, put up with it in an unbiblical way. But we bear with one another. First Peter chapter 4, verse 8 says, Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. Because love covers a multitude of sins. We bear with one another. That word fervent in 1 Peter means to stretch to the utmost. Don't be slack in our love. And what's love do? It bears with all things. It covers a multitude of sins. Proverbs 17, 9 says, He who conceals transgression seeks love. He who repeats a matter separates intimate friends. You want to separate intimate friends? Find a fault and start nagging at it. To them or to someone else. Take a knife going through. That's not what love does. Love bears all things, others' weaknesses, others' immaturities. Love never gives up and never surrenders. It keeps going. It believes all things. It's not doctrinally gullible. It's not going to believe Christ isn't God. Oh, yeah. It's not doctrinally gullible. But it's not cynical and suspicious. It's, it believes a fellow believer when they say something. Unless there's clear, very provable, distinct, right in front of you, evidence to the contrary. Love believes all things. Spurgeon said, better to be deceived a hundred times than to live in suspicion. Suspicion makes you your own tormentor, and it makes everyone else a criminal, even when they're silent. No one can win in suspicion. You know, but be careful. Love believes all things. The world says, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on you. Three strikes are out. Love believes all things. You know, someone believe tell you something? Believe it. Not doctrinally things. On the other hand, we just say, gossip? You know, don't just take gossip. We don't listen to it in the first place. If you hear something about a believer, don't just take it with a grain of salt. Take it with a giant boulder of salt. How many times things go around it's like a telephone game? Starts over here. And who knows whether someone purposely twisted it or didn't purposely twist it. And before you know it, someone over here is a murderer. Love believes all things. Not suspicious, cynical. Love hopes all things. Always looking for better days. Now, it's not that we think there's good in man. But God is good and He is at work. We don't give up on the salvation of unbelievers even after a year, or 10 years, 20 years. There's life, there's hope. We don't give up on fellow believers. Yeah, they've stumbled. Yeah, they're not perfect yet. Yeah, you know what? But God's at work. And God is faithful. And He'll call, He'll, he'll get them to glory. And He'll work on them until then. Love hopes all things. You know, there's an optimism to love. There's a realism in a, in a sense. I know this life will not be Sunshine and roses all the time. But there's an optimism. God's at work in them. And why can you be patient? Because God's still working. Love endures all things, verse 7. You see these words are, some of them are, this is basically a synonym of love is patient. It starts out, love is patient. And love endures all things. Endures means it remains under the load. The load of difficulty, the load of hardship, it remains under. It doesn't throw up the white flag and throw in the towel. It endures. It keeps going. Yep. There's provocation. Yep. Others have truly done wrong to me. 
I don't take it into account. I'm not contacting in love. And I keep going no matter what. Love endures all things. Then verse 8, last one. He transitions to the permanence of love. He says in verse 8, love never fails. Doesn't mean it's always perfect. Doesn't mean it doesn't stumble. But it keeps going no matter what. This is God's love for us. Romans chapter 8. Nothing will separate us from the love of God. Nothing in this life and nothing for eternity. And God has put His love in His children's lives. And that love cannot fail. It will not fail. It will stumble. It will be weak. But God will pick them up and they will keep going in love. And the world says sometimes, I just don't love them anymore. Well, that's a lie. And we're talking about this type of biblical Christian love. The lie isn't that you don't love them anymore. The lie is you ever love them at all. Biblical love, the love we're talking about here, doesn't fail. It keeps going. In this life and for eternity. Look at verse 13 of chapter 13. He'll say in verse 8 to 12, some of the gifts are going to cease, but love does not cease. And then verse 13, now faith, hope, and love abide these three. But the greatest is love. Love will last longer than all the gifts. I tell you, love will last longer even than faith and hope. My faith will be made sight. I will experience what I'm hoping for now. But you know what? will remain 100 billion years from now, we will still love one another. You might as well start loving one another now and practicing it and excelling still more in it. But it's going to be what we do for all eternity. Look at chapter 14, verse 1, and we'll wrap up. After talking about love, and we didn't we always go into much more detail than things we looked at chapter 13. Verse, chapter 14, verse 1 says... Pursue love. Yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts. But pursue love. The word pursue is translated in other places. Persecute. It means to run after with energy to try to grab, to try to you know, persecute, try to persecute them. And pursue means to grab them to, you know, with, with energy, with zeal, with zesto. Pursue love. You know, those who know the Lord. We do love one another. If there's no love, there's no salvation. First John makes that abundantly clear repeatedly. But believers do love one another, but we must practice love, pursue love, excel still more in love. How are we doing? Where are we at? You know, it's going to be work. First Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul says he thanks God for the Thessalonians because of their labor of love. Loving someone doesn't mean loving them and practicing love is going to be easy. It's going to be hard work. A labor. Not burdensome. First John says God's commandments are not burdensome because we've been born again. They're not burdensome. Because He's changed me on the inside. But there are going to be hard work to put into practice. Yep, someone's going to wrong me. What's love going to do? I'm not going to mark it down. I won't treat them in kind. Pursue love. And a good exercise to do, and I think many people have noted this, but if you read through verse 4 to 7, plug your own name in there. Love is this. Plug your own name in and say, is this what I am? Am I practicing love as I need to be? Am I this? Am I this? Am I this? Am I this? And excel still more in it. You know, a scary thing is verse 1 through 3 makes clear. To the extent that we don't function in love, even if we're making great sacrifices externally and using my gift, but it's not driven and governed by the love that's described in the Bible, it's useless to me. I'm a zero, and I'll earn a zero at the being seat of Christ. <laughs> Serious matter. To make sure we're functioning in biblical love as described here. And if there's no love, there's no salvation. And the solution, if you sit here and you know what, I just, I don't care about fellow believers. 
and I have no interest in being kind to them. I want to bark up the tallies as much as possible. You know what? You have to examine, am I a believer in the first place? Because God himself teaches us to love one another. Let's say where I'm at with the Lord. And don't deceive yourself, though. Don't get confused. The solution is not to try to love. If there's no love in your life. There's no Lord. There's no salvation. The solution isn't then I'm going to try to love others the best I can. That's not the gospel. The solution isn't I'm going to try to love others as I should if you're not saved first. The solution is to understand I am a sinner and this is love. Not that we love God. But that Christ loved us and gave Himself a propitiation for our sins. All turn from all other gods, all other trust, to cling to Christ alone. For my salvation, to escape from hell, to know the Lord. Then He'll produce His love progressively in your life. Don't say, I'm going to clean my life and try to be a Christian if you're not. Don't try to produce love in your life if you ever first trusted Christ. And in those who have trusted Christ, we study it, and this is the familiar se se like section to all of us, right? I didn't have anything new to tell you every way this morning. But the Word of God needs to continually challenge us, encourage us. We hold it up like a mirror to our face and say, how do I need to change? How can I excel still more? To please the Lord and to practice love. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for your great love for us. That Christ died in our place. He lives today. That simple faith in Him, faith in you, forgives us, causes us to be born again. Lord, any here who do not know you, who haven't understood and believed the love you have in Christ, or convict them of their sin, their need of righteousness, their hopeless and lost condition. But may they see Christ and flee to Him, trusting Him for salvation. Lord, thank You for not only saving us, but transforming us from the inside out. Your indwelling Spirit to conform us to the image of Christ. Lord, may we grow in love. May we practice love more consistently. We will stumble. We are not perfect yet. Lord, but we are to learn your word, to by your power of your spirit, to put it into practice. Lord, help me, help all of us, to excel still more in love. Thank you for your great love for us in Christ Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.